Hi everyone, my name is Jane Ann Jaworski. I will be presenting a short slide presentation concerning pediatric intestinal failure and some information on strategies to prevent and treat malnutrition. The first thing we'll discuss is the definition of malnutrition. According to the World Health Organization, malnutrition refers to the following. Undernutrition, which includes wasting, stunting of growth, and being underweight, could also be because of the lack of vitamins and minerals. And being obese is also included in malnutrition. And finally, diet-related non-communicable diseases such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and some forms of cancer. Pediatric malnutrition is encompassed by a definition of an, an imbalance between nutrient requirements and intake that re results in cumulative deficits of energy, protein, and micronutrients that may negatively affect growth, development, and other relative outcomes. Malnutrition is either illness-related, or non-illness related or a combination of both. The definition of pediatric intestinal failure is below and it's stated as reduction of functional intestinal mass below that which can sustain life autonomously resulting in dependence on supplemental parenteral support for a minimum of 60 days within a 74 consecutive day interval. This includes all disorders of the bowel, which include short bowel syndrome, motility disorders, including intestinal pseudo obstruction, and mucosal enteropathy, which would example would be microvillus inclusion disease. Nutrition support is usually in the forms of two, two entities, which we all know very well, parental nutrition and enteral nutrition, or a combination of both. Most pediatric intestinal failure patients are on TPN, but the majority receive combination therapy. Over time, the TPN is gradually reduced and the child is subsequently maintained on nutrition via enteral therapy. Transitioning to home on either of these therapies requires a lot of help from many different people. Many states have government assisted services that will follow children. For example, some states have early intervention programs which provide a dietitian, physical occupation and or speech therapist, as well as a home health nurse who will do weight checks and follow up with the medical team. They also help with some teaching as to mixing formula and basic oral aversion work. Most home infusion services are also linked with a home care nursing agency who will obtain weekly labs do central line dressing changes and weight checks, and provide an overall assessment of the patient. They routinely call the medical provider to provide updates. This slide indicates the primary indicators of malnutrition. This is a very busy slide, but also very helpful. It clearly defines what malnutrition looks like in the pediatric patient. Please take time to review this slide to help you to recognize the more common data points. The important biochemical markers for children with pediatric intestinal failure on TPN are below, which include weekly parenteral nutrition labs, and they should include a CBC different platelets, a CMP, LFTs, and triglyceride levels. Vitamin levels, trace element levels, and carnitine levels should be attained around every three to four months and should include B12, A, E, and D. For the trace elements, we would like zinc, chromium, manganese, copper, selenium, and then a carnitine level would be appropriate every three to four months. The indications for biochemical markers with children on enteral nutrition would be a CDC and diff, diff every six months, a CMP every six months, vitamin and trace elements every six months as well. Also, um, one of the things that is very important in the, in the prevention of nutrient deficiency in this group are pharm pharmacological agents. There are several classes of medication that may help reduce significant diarrhea and hence may or may not help with better absorption of nutrients, vitamins, and the like via the intestinal tract. The first group is H2 blockers such as 
omeprazole or famotidine. The other group would be an anti-motility agent or anti-diarrheals, um, which would include loperamide. And the third group is selective decontamination antibiotics, the most popular being flagyl um, or neomycin. The most important part of all of this is the ongoing nutritional assessment. We need to monitor fat-soluble vitamins. We need to monitor trace element levels. As the children get older, we should include bone density as part of their nutritional uh, assessment. Routine follow-ups to the office and clinic are vital. The use of a multidisciplinary team to assess for growth and any disparities that trigger deficiencies one example would be zinc deficiency is easily identified by diaper rash, which could be atopic dermatitis as a result of zinc deficiency. And as we all know, zinc is lost in abundance in the stool. This ends the presentation. Thank you so much for listening.